quick story that actually got cut from the presentation because I was afraid it would take too long. But uh, got called into an uh, incident one time at a very big like Fortune 500 company by the, uh, the fraud investigators. And they'd uncovered fraud in the accounting department. So while they were rounding up suspects and interviewing people and doing stuff like that, they asked our team to seize all the computers. So we went through and took all the computers, bagged them, tagged them, chained in custody, wrapped them up, had them all in the van, went back up to check in with the, uh, the, the CPAs and the fraud investigators, and we're like, okay, you know, what else do we need to do? And they said, oh, wait a minute. Um, they need to cut us a retainer check, and you took all the accounting system. <laughs> go back out there, pick a computer, bring it back up here, hook it back up so we can actually log in and uh, print a check. So that was part of the uh, make sure you get paid that we'll cover my book. That's always one of my favorite stories. And when I when I run into those guys, I always give them grief about that. So remember, you get in a situation where you're seizing all the computers, you know, just double check and make sure that you, that you don't take the one they're supposed to pay for. <laughs> How many people in the room are members of the Electronic Frontier Foundation? Show hands. Okay, that's good, but needs to be better. If you are in this room right now, by definition, you need to be a member of EFF. Um, no organization out there is, is protecting the internet, protecting privacy, fighting the government at every turn. So most definitely please uh, join EFF. And I tell you what, I actually have some of our silly little buttons, it doesn't mean much, but if you if you are an EFF member, or you promise that you will join, because it's really easy, um, you can like come and get a button after it's over with, just as my way of saying thank you. I know it's a little button, but it means something. And also, if you're a big fan of Dragon Con, um, you may not realize that Dragon Con and, uh, over here. Dragon Con and EFF, and also the uh, uh, Electronic Frontiers of Georgia, yeah. Um, a lot of people don't appreciate that Dragon Con kind of came out of the work that, uh, that, that Scott and those guys did back in the early days. So EFF and um, the EFF uh, equipment, Electronic Frontiers of Georgia and Dragon Con, um, all, but there is a Dragon expert and an information systems analyst, which basically means he is the guy who looks for problems, chases them down, you know, tries to help us catch the bad guys and look for the vulnerabilities and stuff like that. And I'm, I'm very, very happy to have uh, Donna Bartley with us. She is an attorney, so those of you who had guessed that, congratulations <laughs> there. Um, she is a, a lawyer out of the UNC School of Law, and she is in corporate compliance, intrusion, risk assessment, and risk management. And if you don't know why she's important, you will by the time this presentation is over with. Because she's, we're going to explain why you always want to have somebody like her around and on your team. Um, so as we get started, let me ask this. How many people here are in a, I guess, you, oh, let's, let's make it simple. You're the guy that somebody calls when there is some type of problem, either a company that you work for, so you're in some type of corporate IT, you maybe work for a system integrator or a, a independent type of place, you have, uh, you're, you're, you know, you work for a mom and pop computer shop or you're your own consultant, or you're just the guy that all your friends and family call. And I'm gonna say, just wave your hands, and that's probably everybody in the room. Excellent. Okay, this is great. Um, this is perfect. Hold on. Yeah. Just so you all know, I'm actually a student in a dual master's program. Okay, I have not graduated yet. I don't want anybody to come back to me and say, oh, they said you were. No, 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 no. Currently, I am a student. I am about 50% uh, through my first, well, I'm on a dual track. I'm about to finish, do my capstone for my first track, then go in, which would be the forensics, then go into the operations. Well, and let's say Brian's got the, the OJT, so no worries about that. As long as we're doing disclaimers. Yes. <laughs> it was UNC, I okay. promise. No. Um, my disclaimer is I am an attorney, but I am not your attorney. <laughs> <laughs> my comments today are purely informative. And the only legal advice I can give you is to seek independent counsel from your own lawyer. <laughs> and, I, and I believe there may be yes, a yes. on the table, but, uh, but, uh, but we also have the disclaimer here that these are not the opinions of the EFF or Dragon Con. And also, again, another thanks to, to Scott Jones and the Electronic Frontier Foundation, all the work that they do uh, setting all this stuff up. Um, so, okay, so again, getting through the uh, the first important disclaimers. As we talked about, um, some of you guys in the room, some of you ladies, 
may work in corporate security, IT security, and the elephant in the room, or as they say, individual mileage may vary, you may have different rules and regulations and policies and procedures based upon the type of company you work for. If you are a Fortune 500 publicly traded, privately traded, if you're a government entity, if you're governed by the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission, if you deal with medical data, some of the things we talk about might be slightly different. So the point is, whatever we talk about, you know, your own industry, it may be different based on your own industry. So, what we're going to talk about today, and, and kind of the gist of it, is how to give you guys, kind of giving you guys a crash course on how to be that person when they call you, um, you know, somebody calls you because there's a problem at your boss or whatever, and what that's referred to as incident response, okay? There is an incident, you are responding to it. So what are some types of incidents? Somebody holler something. Some, what, 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 what would we be talking about? We're a bunch of computer, IT, and security people. What's an incident? Somebody just say something. Ransomware. A what? That, that could be. <laughs> that could be. Oh, I'm sorry. If everybody could kind of try and move into any empty seats so that the fire marshal doesn't tell us anything nasty, we oh, really appreciate it. The fire marshal's involved now. Ooh. That makes me feel better. <laughs> a little bit warm and tingly. If you know. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, warm and tingly. He's going to drink more now that he knows there's a fire marshal. It makes him good. <laughs> if you have an empty seat beside you, raise your hand. We've got plenty of empty seats. Yeah. Oh, no, right. Come on, go ahead. Oh, I'm not sure I'm saying. However, remember when we tell the story later, there were no empty seats anywhere, oh, and they were we were turning people away. <laughs> we're very close to that now. Okay. See, you're not lying. You're living the dream. We'll get a bigger room next year. But uh, that gentleman out there, somebody had uh, a raised hand against the wall. He looks like a beat up 80s punk. <laughs> there he is. He's got the bandana around his head and his glasses. Back there you go. He's oh, about, Michael to, get, Jackson, he's about to go his separate ways. He's going to sing some journey for us. Um, <laughs> all right. So. So shout out some stuff for me, just seriously, instance. What, what will we be talking about? Intrusion? Okay. Just say things. Somebody gets that notice to call Microsoft because their computer has been hacked. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Good deal. Things like that. Anything like that. All right. So, Account lockouts. All right. <laughs> so, so when we talk about incidents, what are we actually talking about? We can break them down into a couple of different kind of categories, and I need to talk a little louder and closer. Excellent. All right. Raise the mic to your face. Hold the mic to your face. All right, so what we have up here, no specific order, but we talk about intrusions. And intrusions can be electronic or physical. You know, somebody broke into the building, somebody hacked into the building. Intentional or random. You know, was your was your client specifically targeted, or was it just an IP surf? They leave some ports open. Was it a phishing attack that just happened to hit your client? Theft, internal or external. You know, did somebody steal something? Did, you know, internally, externally. Internal fraud. And when we say internal fraud, systemic. You might be called in at a company, and the whole company's a criminal enterprise. Everybody's guilty. Everybody's doing something wrong. Or it could be specific employee misconduct, embezzlement, theft, things like that. Termination. Sometimes you might be called, if an employee's getting terminated, that's an incident. And some of the biggest mistakes companies make is not handling termination correctly. Uh, they get a lot of trouble with, you know, trusting somebody to go back and clean their desk out, and they're actually uh, cleaning out the server, things like that. But um, it can be, uh, termination can be a problem when you're terminating the employee, prior to terminating the employee. Maybe there's some stuff that you need to do before you terminate somebody. And finally, it could be the big, one of the biggest growth that we're seeing uh, is theft of trade secrets. Somebody leaves one company, goes to work for another company, violates a non-disclosure, or takes uh, company documents with them. That's also considered an incident and something you may find yourself investigating. And finally, litigation response, which basically means uh, if your company that you're working with or helping out, if they're suing somebody else, that can be considered an incident. There will be documents and data and stuff that you'll need to preserve and work with, or if they're getting sued there'll be uh, documents and data you need to work with. So all of these things can be incidents. And it's easy just to think of incident as somebody got a phishing email or there was unusual activity on the server or the firewall. But all of this stuff is stuff that people with your skills 
you know, our skills, everybody, um, would be called in to investigate. And so understanding what incidents are and that this is what they are. So, okay, real quick now. So what's the first thing you do when you get that phone call? When your boss or a friend or a potential client says, oh my gosh, all the files on the server are now encrypted or something, what, what do you do first? Unplug it. That's very funny. <laughs> right? I mean... Any, any, other, any other ideas, some things that you would do first? Check your contract. Okay, and here's the thing. Y'all are going to think this is an incredible buzzkill when I show you this next slide, but here are the things you need to do first. First thing you need to do is find out how you're going to get paid. That's right. That's right. This is where the story about putting the computer back in to cut a check comes in. But more importantly, um, you know, when an incident happens and people are desperate and, oh my gosh, the world's coming to an end and somebody's in our server, they're going to tell you things like, take all the time you need, spend all the money you have to, put all the hours into it you can. Um, and there can be some buyer's remorse afterward. So, you know, who's going to pay you? How much you're going to get paid? That is the first question. Um, there's also some legal protections in the fact that the company has agreed to pay you as opposed to you trying to get paid later. Uh, as we also may discuss, there are times when there will be incidents that a company doesn't want anybody to know about. And if you did work and the company doesn't want anybody to know about it, it can be really hard to get paid. That's the first question. As you see, what is the second question? Who is the attorney? If you are working in any type of intrusion, in any type of incident response, if you're just helping out some small company because they had an incident, you want to find out who their attorney is and talk to their attorney. Why do you want to do that? Let me count the ways. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I mean, there are a number of reasons that you would want to speak with their attorney. Uh, ideally, you may also want to speak with your attorney. Um, your client should have an incident response team. If they are a large company or they do federal contracting, they may be required to have a business, a, a business continuity plan, disaster recovery plan, incident response team. And someone from legal should be on that incident response team. You need to be able to make sure that you're working with their attorney because their attorney is, is the one who should be directing that investigation. Their attorney should be, everything should be flowing through that attorney in order to preserve confidentiality, preserve privilege. If you do end up in litigation, that attorney is the one giving legal advice. And so you working through that attorney ensures that you're giving the attorney information and that attorney is then using that to provide legal advice to your client. So that's one of the most important reasons that you want to make sure you're working through an attorney. Um, well, and, and uh, you know, as, as Donna said, the other issues, and it may seem awkward. You know, when somebody calls you and says, oh my gosh, our business just got hacked and we've lost some data, and the first thing you say is, after, you know, are you going to pay me for this? The second thing you say is, you know, I need to talk to your attorney. But there are reasons. There are things like notification requirements, depending upon the type of data. Um, you need to know who to talk to. If you're dealing with a situation where there might be criminals or something inside the company, um, you want to talk to the attorney. You want to have work product protections. If you are communicating and working in the direction of their attorney, then you have protections for what you talk about. It may be that you see things, um, data or, or liabilities or things that the company didn't do right that they should have, that you don't want to have to testify about. So asking that question, as awkward as it may be, um, is, is something that protects yourself and it also ultimately protects the company, which rolls into the next, um, next issue, is determining the chain of command. When you talk to the attorney or you talk to the person who engaged you, you want to find out exactly who you are reporting to, and a lot of times that can be kind of awkward. Let's say, for example, you work in corporate IT and you have a boss and there is some type of incident, your boss may be the guilty party, your boss may be the suspect. It happens a lot of times that a, a lower level person in an accounting department is asked to do an investigation of accounting irregularities and it turns out to be their boss. So, so I guess what I'm trying to say is you may be in corporate IT, you may be investigating an issue at your company and it may be that your boss is not the one you report to. You and the attorney are going to work that out and it may be that the attorney says you just talk to me about it. And, um, and what do you think, Brian, what do you think about uh, making sure that you have a hold harmless or a... Uh... Uh, 
first off, one of the things that I'm going to do is I'm going to produce a piece of paper. It's my get out of jail free card. Mm. Uh, if you want me on your premise before I do anything, you will sign this piece of paper. Um, I'm sorry, I won't do anything until that is signed. Uh, I'm going to want to know everything about the lawyer, everything. I'm one of those info junkies. But that piece of paper will be signed first. I don't even want to know what the incident's about. Because, as you said, information getting out. Banks are hacked every day. It's not a secret. But the level of hack that they have to report to the public is a very, very, very hard gambit to run through. You know, depending on how much information is released, do they have to report it? Now, if I walk into a room and you're trying to hire me to do something, and I don't have this paper signed, and I touch something and it breaks, I'm not liable. No. That will not happen to me. Yeah, and that's a very important point, too, because you have to think of yourself sometimes as being the bomb squad guys, and you're trying to defuse a bomb, but it could blow up in your face, especially when you're talking about, um, you know, some of the cryptoware stuff and things like that. If you're working on it, investigating, if you're trying to do a, uh, you know, if you've got a live incident, you've got a live hacking situation, you're trying to fight it, you know, you need some protection to protect you in case it blows up while you're the one that's trying to fix it. So, Remember how I said I wasn't going to give you any advice? <laughs> <laughs> this is not speech. legal advice, but seek counsel. And my suggestion is that you do it now. Don't do it later. You need a boilerplate agreement that you can produce when that client calls you which means you need to put something in place with an attorney and preferably, well, ideally, it should be an attorney who has some experience with privacy, cyber intrusion, security, these, this kind of law, because they will know what sort of provisions need to be in a boilerplate contract that can protect you. You need to protect yourself as well as your client from liability, but that means you need to have something in place right up front, which, and you don't want to be looking for that when that client calls you. Minutes are very precious. So my suggestion is if you don't have a boilerplate agreement, find an attorney and just put one in place. If you do it now while you have time, you're in a much better position to locate the right attorney, the right law firm, negotiate cheap rates because it's not an emergency. You don't have to pay whatever they'll charge. So you're in a much stronger position if you do that now. And, and I don't want to be a buzzkill. I mean, let's let's face it, uh, intrusion, this kind of stuff that we're talking about, this is the growth industry. This is where we're heading. You know, the Internet of Things, everything's connected. You know, you might have to investigate somebody's toaster spying on them. The point is, the point is what we're talking about doing and the precautions to take, it's very simple. You know, um, just knowing to ask, you know, how much am I going to get paid, who's going to be responsible, knowing who the corporate counsel is, and having a very simple contract that you've had an attorney approve you know, somebody calls you, you just email it over to them. The point is you take those couple steps. First of all, that puts you ahead of a lot of sole proprietors and small companies and incident response people who don't do that. So that, that's also, but this can be a very rewarding field in a lot of ways. So just make sure you do your homework. So, all right, here we go. Now we get to the, the cool stuff here. So we, 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 we're on site now. We've, we've taken care of all the attorney, the crazy billing stuff. Now, how are we going to approach this? So what, what's the normal systematic approach to this? So what we're talking about is our first step. And the first step is, is this really an incident? How many people here have had a situation where somebody swore there was something going on and it really wasn't? I mean, exactly. Okay, let's just say the number one computer hacking organization out there is called Windows Updates, right? <laughs> um, Tuesday morning death. Yeah, yeah. So, so is this really an incident? Is it a false positive? That's the first question you want to ask, all right? Second thing that comes up, and, and you have an obligation to do, is what we call stop the bleeding. You know, what, whatever, you know if, it's, if it's an active data theft, if it's an active crime, if things are actively being stolen, you have an obligation to do what you can to stop that, but there may be situations where you're not allowed to. It may be that the, the attorneys or the people who are making decisions say, okay, you know, you've identified that somebody's stealing money. We're going to figure, we're going to catch them in the act, we're going to do something else. So you have an obligation to stop the bleeding unless you're told not to and to let it go on. So maybe it can be monitored or something like that. Or if you're trying to trace the uh, the perpetrator back, then maybe you don't cut off their access immediately. But that's that's something that, that has to be weighed. And usually you want attorneys making that decision. Um, what are my notification requirements, Don? Why is that important? What are notification requirements? Notification requirements. Uh, many, um, many corporations, many... Uh, 
private um, in, even individuals in many cases will be obligated by law or by contract or by federal regulation to notify uh, regulators they'll be required to notify their clients uh, of whatever the breach is and again this it, it, it depends on what their client requirements are what their statutory obligations are so this is a, something you should work through an attorney on because an attorney with you know, experience in this area can quickly identify what those obligations are who needs to be notified and exactly what they need to know like an example might be a certain type of uh, so if you notice that there's a breach and you see that a certain type of uh, user data or customer data has been compromised let's say for example uh, you know a real estate office who has lost uh, social security numbers and things like that from tax forms that were, were taken you have 10 days they have 10 days to notify their customers in writing about the breach so from the point they discover it you've got less than 10 days to figure out which customers were uh, you know were compromised in medical record situations there's there's a lot of things like that so notification requirements again you don't have to notify anybody but understanding what the the requirements are going to be for the type of data you're working for can help you as you're doing your job and it also helps you to understand the time pressures that you're under which comes to the uh, kind of the the point number four well let me go back to notification requirements um, the problem is if you have a company that's had an incident and they're looking at having to notify their customers that they have screwed up they don't want to do that. That's that's bad. You know, think Target, think Home Depot, think Ashley Madison. Think about all these these big hacks that we've had to deal with, and that's been it, it's been the PR part of the problem. It's not been the money. It's been that part. So, with that said, the people who are responsible for deciding the notification are going to want to what notify as few people as possible. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's where we come to. Item number four, when you are triaging an incident, any kind of incident, but if, you know, let's say we're talking about a data loss or data theft incident, you know, kind of work from the worst case scenario inward. What is the worst possible thing that could happen? Now, you know, scared business people, uh, attorneys, boards of directors, they don't want to hear the worst case scenario first, right? But that's what you need to do. You need to start with oh my god what is the worst possible thing that could happen what's the worst amount of data if they had access to this drive then the worst thing that can happen is all that data on that drive has been compromised and then you then you start working inward from there um, and, and I guess we'll, we'll join that Brian you know with with conservatively eliminating possibilities as they say that that even if you don't know what happened if you can eliminate what didn't happen what do you think all how do I put this? All incidents are very different. And real quick, show of hands, how many people have been approached by their company to, uh, I need you to look at this real quick? And how many people actually found something was wrong? About half, okay. Now, without saying what you do, uh, just in a quick portion of it, uh, how often do you mess with those problems? Well, every day, once a week, maybe once a month? frequently okay so the idea is conservatively eliminating the processes or possibilities so we have one thing that's really messed up say you have a server that's messed up you're eliminating it first thing I would do probably isolate the server because I want to make sure what's going on maybe if it's a constant thing and we're letting it run to collect data maybe turn on the shadow copies enable it you're using Windows this is something that the machine already has and then you want to keep your fingerprint as minimal as possible your digital fingerprint cannot get all over this machine if it is a, a system that's a critical system supporting something maybe it's air gapped it's inside so you run into different difficulties there and you're trying the machine can't come down the scenario is your machine can't come down so you want to use something like this because you can collect the data right off of it and see what's happening uh, proc mom, proc exec, so you can turn it up and then you can follow back to is this a, a system on the machine or is this something it's calling out to depending on what it is. So it'll open it up, the things are there for you to read it. J not just event viewer but that does have a lot of information in it. Uh, you want to pay attention to a lot of these things but keep your, your digital fingerprint as minimal as possible because if you damage it it's worthless. All your evidence is gone. 
And um, oh, sorry. And what I was going to say is, is yes. Yeah, so, so like what Brian was saying, when you look at the, um, when you look at what possibly happened, or you're trying to figure out what happened, and again, when you start with the worst case scenario and work in, um, you know. I isolating, obviously you want to isolate, like you said, you want to isolate potentially uh, infiltrated equipment from non-infiltrated equipment, but what you also want to do is if, uh, if you know, okay, we've seen this data has been compromised, well, can we eliminate the possibility that it came external, maybe somebody in it from you, so even if you don't know what happened, if you know what didn't happen, and what's the old saying? You know, if you've eliminated, if you've eliminated all the other answers, the, the the only one left, regardless of how absurd your answer, that kind of thing. So think in terms of that. Think in terms of, you know, if you have a room full of people and you don't know who your suspect is, if you know who your suspect's not, and you can get rid of those, it slowly works yourself down to the solution of the problem. Um, and we talk about identifying assets and liabilities. When you get on site or you're triaging an incident. Also think in terms of, okay, what do I have working in my favor? What do I have working against me? And some examples of assets and liabilities, you know, uh, uh, an, uh, an on-site IT guy who knows the system really well, well that's an asset. Um, we only have logging going for, you know, 10 days. That might be a liability. Things like that. So, so think in terms of what tools do I have to help me with what things, you know, are going to be challenges. Um, if you identify those, that can help you kind of figure out which direction your um, your investigation goes in. And I guess, uh, and, and looking at my panel here too, has any of you guys ever asked to be the hero? Um, when when Brian was talking about being approached by somebody from your company, you know, one of the things that your that, that companies are looking for when there's been an incident is they want somebody to tell them it's going to be okay. All right, mm -hmm. and telling them that it's going to be okay. Can, can make it feel like a hero and they're going to be really happy with you and pat you on the back and maybe even pay you well. Mm -hmm. And that's a big problem. That's something you have to look out for. Because ultimately you may be having to give them information that they don't really want to hear. Um, and you may give them bad information that they may you know, not do good things with. So if, if you don't know if everything's going to be okay, resist the temptation to say it's going to be okay. You know, it's not like when your kid falls down and, and breaks their arm and you go, okay, it's going to be all right. You know? <laughs> Don't do that. You can't do that because you don't know. You know, no, no. I'm sure our data didn't get lost. Things like that. It's very important for whatever lawyer you're working through. Also, they are going to want to know the worst case scenario. So you need to be completely on the table with them, and you really do need to start from uh, the the perspective that you need to put everything out there. Because the attorney is the one who needs to figure out if there if there's going to be some sort of a spin, if there's a relationship that needs to be managed, if there's a way of managing that information to mitigate the damage, leave that to the attorney. Your job is to tell them everything that you find in really as horrible detail as possible. And then later you could be the hero. Later you can say, oh no, it's not that bad, right? You can play Scotty. Yeah, I know. You, hey. Brian, you ever been asked to write a letter? How many people here have been asked to write a letter? You know what we're talking about? Yeah, Brian, talk about. You, been, you Brian, I need you to write me a letter. Yeah, write me a letter good luck with that. Okay. Good luck with that idea. My name won't go on anything there. But um, really quick, I wanted to add something to uh, what you're saying here. Uh, so when you're asked to do these things and you're asked to be the hero, and you know we're talking about how it could go bad on you. Think about. A guy who's sitting in his office, no big deal, he has his boss, his boss is the one who ends up getting caught. And you have to respond to the lawyer she's talking about. Uh, not her, of course. <laughs> Somebody else. She's one of the good ones. What do you, the number one thing that we have to do, beyond all other measure, you need to stay biased, or unbiased, rather. Oops. Oops. About that letter again. So, we'll, start, we'll start the bidding. <laughs> but you, you have to say black and white. If you go to gray, you're done. If you put it, um, Derek is in court, and Derek gets caught going into gray, everything he's ever been a part of now comes into question. If you guys think that that's a TV ploy just for adding drama, no. They will turn the fire on fast, and I don't know if you can cover all that, all those coals at once. Yeah, but, exactly, and, and, and just for perspective, I, I, I end up being the guy who goes to court. And I've testified well over 150 times. I think we quit counting at that point, but, um, and, and it is. 
it, you know, it, it is black and white, you know, you don't go gray. And um, what, I know my assistants are going to make a joke about me saying you don't go gray. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, when we talked about, what we were joking about, about, about writing a letter, is you're going to have somebody come to me, come to me, come to you, and, and say, okay, I know you found that we lost all this data. I know that this happened or that happened. I just need you to write a letter and say it didn't, or say it was okay, or say that, that you know, just, just say that everything's fixed. That's another thing, too, is you're going to, you're going to find a problem, and we'll get to that in, in another slide, and they're going to want you to write a letter and say everything's fine now. And you need to be really careful with that, um, because then all of a sudden you're transferring all the liability off of them and onto you. And, uh, and then also it can, it can have uh, career implications if you're not careful. So, All right, so mm -hmm. the next step then, and we'll move along so we'll have some time for questions. But documenting the damage. So you've done your, you've done your between these last two slides, you've done your investigation. You, you've, you've figured out what was going on. Um, you've identified the problems. You've kind of figured out how bad it is. Um, and, and most of this should be second nature. But, uh, you know, make sure you're taking good notes, logging what you do, saving all your communications. And there's an asterisk by that because, uh, go figure, Don, sometimes the attorney may tell you not to put it in an email. Um. <laughs> That's very true. I mentioned confidentiality earlier and privilege. And, there, and if you get into a litigation battle, anything written is subject to discovery. And even if that, even if you're sending an email or drafting a letter and you're directing it to the attorney, there are times when the attorney can't protect those things. If you're in an e-discovery battle and the other side makes a compelling argument, the court may require that document to be turned over. So it, even though you're sending it to an attorney, there's no guarantee that it's going to remain confidential. Again, make sure that you're working closely with the attorney so that you know what you can and cannot put in writing. So if you well, we have a we have a uh, sign up in our office that says "Dance as if no one's looking" and email like it will be read aloud in court. <laughs> um, but it, it may come down to where you have found something just really awesomely explosive and you can't wait to fire off that email. I would say give them a call first. <laughs> um, you know, yes, sir. Well, the solution to that be? Uh, Can you have the uh, square oh, sorry, sorry, I forgot we have to leave on. Uh, no, just so everybody else can hear it. Yeah. Would a, would a solution to that be, uh, say, don't put anything down in writing, like an email, for example? How about just simply calling the attorney? Is, is that subject to discovery? Assuming it's not a recorded line, you should be fine. Yeah. And, and just to clarify, I, you know, keeping good notes, keeping all your communication, that's important. What we're saying is that um, if, if, if you're going to hypothesize if you're going to possibly point some fingers maybe say hey look it was an inside job and I think you know the whole company's crooked those are probably conversations for the first time to have you know over the phone with with the attorney that you're working with before you just you know bust out an email you know don't 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 carbon copy everybody in the company saying that the, the, the CEO's uh, a crook and you do want to know by the way if the telephone lines are recorded mm -hmm. I mean a lot of a lot of companies are doing that they're recording all calls and you want to know if your calls are being recorded. Well, and also, when, um, like the movie Contact, when uh, they first got the alien signal, and the first thing Jodie Foster said was, prove me wrong. <laughs> and there may be a lot of times where, how many times has the first impression been the wrong impression? So you also want to, um, you know, not firing off that email and, and waiting to discuss your preliminary ideas, you know, over the phone might give you time to make sure you've explored every, uh, you know, every possibility there. And so obviously the next step, collecting evidence. Some of you may be in, in imaging servers and stuff like that. I'll see, get you one second, sir. Um, you know, make sure if there's, you know, computers to image, information to download, make sure you're, of course, saving all that. Um, even in, in what may seem like a very simple scenario, Again, you never know when something's going to end up in court and where all your work, you need to show your work. Um, conduct interviews. Now, just because this is interesting, as part of my job as also a fraud investigator, sometimes I have to interview people. I have to ask them questions. I have to talk to them. And um, while that may not be something that you actually do, you know, talking to potential suspects, I just always think it's kind of interesting that if you're, if you're dealing with intrusion, okay, you work inside out. And what that means is, when you're conducting interviews and you're gathering information, you're talking to people, you know, talk to the people inside the company who may know things about how things are set up or potential vulnerabilities as you work outside with your interviews. 
but if it's fraud, right, um, internal fraud, you interview from the outside in, which means if you have a suspect and that's the person that you really think did it, you interview them last. You talk to everybody else first so that when you actually go to interview that suspect, you've got all the other information from everybody else. And that seems a little counterintuitive until you think about it because you're like, if I have a suspect and I think this guy's guilty, I'm going to go straight to that person. But what you do is you talk to all your other witnesses first. And that can be kind of a good metaphor for, you know, when you're, when you're gathering all your information. Obviously, you would process and analyze your data. You would do reports, perhaps. Um, and then, uh, and then I guess I'll let you uh, tell us about this next point. This is also why you would want the attorney. Right. Uh, well, let me ask this. How many people have had a situation where you were looking for data for your investigation and, and it was somewhere you couldn't really get to it because Google had it or Apple had it or somewhere else? That's where having the attorney helps you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, you At that point, you'll want to suggest to the attorney that they implement litigation holds. Um, are, are, is anyone not familiar with what a litigation hold is? Okay, excellent. All right. Um, a litigation hold is any time there is a, if information is prepared with the anticipation of litigation, if you reasonably anticipate that litigation could occur, the company is obligated to preserve everything. So if you are in a situation where you're, you suspect, if there's a remote possibility, which is pretty much going to be all the time, you definitely should suggest a litigation hold and give the you need to talk with the attorney about the scope of that hold tell them who is who's going to be involved what employees what levels of information what technologies uh, and we're talking everything mobile phones telephones recordings computers um, PDAs if anybody uses those anymore um, all of that um, so you definitely want to go through that process with the attorney oh and I was gonna say so the difference between litigation hold and a subpoena and a subpoena um, the other side of that is the litigation hold is within your company. Their obligation is to preserve and not destroy any evidence, any hard evidence that might have to be used in their court battle. The subpoena is for data that's outside of the organization, such as something on Google or you know, some um, IP logs, IP, right. things like that. So if you're going to have to, if you're going to need information from a third party, the attorney can then get a subpoena issued now or later but at least they will know what information is necessary and they can su issue a subpoena which is essentially a court order to that third party to disclose this information to you I mean subpoenas are are they can object to the subpoena they can file motions against the subpoena they'll try to resist it I'm sure you've all heard about times when subpoenas have and have not been successfully resisted. But that's something, again, that the attorney was going to deal with, and they'll be able to figure out how to get that done the best way possible. Okay, so like a quick real-world example might be that you discover a funny IP address in your server logs after a, an intrusion. Well, you know, all of us, we're going to go to Google and we're going to do a lookup and see who owns the IP address, and you're like, oh, it's a residential Time Warner address from, you know, you know Atlanta or something like that. Well. The next step, if law enforcement's not involved and you let them handle it, the next step would be that you would want to subpoena Time Warner for the account holder information for that IP address. Well, part of the problem can be that, let's say, maybe not Time Warner, but whoever your entity you're going after the information, maybe they only keep their logs for 30 days, okay? And you've discovered you know, it's, it's already day 20 when you discovered this. Um, when you issue a subpoena, it's basically a piece of paper that says, hey, you need to turn over this information to us, and there are legal requirements that they do that or not. Well, it can take time for a subpoena to be filled. You send a subpoena to Time Warner, they may take 30 to 60 days to get around to complying with the subpoena, all right? A litigation hold letter is kind of like a subpoena light, because you can send a, so you can send a litigation hold letter that says, hey, you need to preserve this. We're going to be coming after it later. So the beauty of a litigation hold letter, especially if there's situations where you're worried about a company's server logs or IP logs or things like that getting purged before the legal process can get them, that's what that does. So that's a thing to discuss. I guess what I'm saying is if there's information you want um, and it's IP address logs or accounts or anything like that, that's why working with the attorney, tell them what you need, tell them as quickly as possible. And if it's something where in your experience, you know, hey, we want this from Apple, but it's going to take a long time to get it, 
they can rush out the litigation hold letter so Apple has to freeze the data. So at least you know by the time you get around to it, it'll be there for you, okay? All right, so finally, the final part of this puzzle is, um, is response tactics. And it may be that um, you're asked to help figure out a solution or remediation. Maybe a long-term solution, you know, put duct tape over it. A long-term solution, you know, replace the whole network. Things like that. Those are things that you may be able to give input into. Um, and is there remediation? You know, if, if the company did something wrong to get themselves hacked, if, if too many people are clicking on emails they're not supposed to, if, you know, there's a, a non-secure backup system which you know, a file by file backup system which allowed all the backups to also get hit with uh, you know ransomware or something like that. There may be remedial things you can offer, remedial things you need to do. You may also recommend things like monitoring or uh, or further analysis. It may be that you've seen an intrusion. At the outset, the intrusion you worked on looks like just another random attack, you know, an external random threat. We closed that hole, we dealt with it. But it may be that you know you need to come back every 30 to 60 days and just double check the logs to make sure that there wasn't something you missed the first time through and it was more than what you thought it was. Um, finally, you may be in a position to have to do final reports or litigation, which happens a lot. <laughs> Somebody may get uh, may get sued over it, and um, and you may need to to testify or be called to testify. And that's actually, I mean, it's it's a fun thing to be a part of. We've all watched the crime shows. We all, you know. LA law, the courtroom dramas and stuff like that. And if you can get yourself in a position to get involved in the legal the legal end of it, it can be really, really fast and you can be really fun work. Um, watching the interplay between the attorneys and the pointing fingers and getting to explain things to the jury and just just as an aside, I always like when um when I'm dealing with a case that has a jury, because usually by the time I testify, they have heard so much absolutely boring stuff. And it's not that I'm saying I'm that interesting, but let's face it, technology is a lot more interesting than, you know, talking about the IRS stuff or the accounting stuff or the psychological stuff. And we can come in there and talk about, you know, hacking cell phones and stuff. Now everybody's awake and listening. So, all right. On that note, I guess it is time to pass the cube around if you guys have some questions and stuff. And I think, yeah, did you still have one in? Oh, they got one in the back that's been old. Oh, my God. Those images are great. So, uh, thinking about the whole uh, discovery thing and your client's liability versus your personal liability, is there any way to document your communication with the attorney that is immune to your client's discovery? Actually, well, I would say my, my, my first thing is that typically your communications with the client's attorney is going to be covered under the client's work product because you're working with the attorney. When you make that phone call, when you make that email, and you've, you've just made that little connection, and, and paperwork doesn't even necessarily have to go back and forth, just the fact that you've connected and, and that you tell the attorney, hey, I'm working for you. you know. And, and here's the thing, too, that you need to make clear with your clients is that you know there's the client and there's the client attorney. And the client's going to be the one paying me, but I work for your attorney. And if you guys disagree, I'm doing what the attorney says. But but I, if I think I understand your question, what, what, what I'm trying to think of is like, say your client, uh, a thousand names and social security numbers got, and you said they have ten days to disclose that. And then later, the attorney says. Uh, you're, you're negligent, you didn't tell me that, and you had told them that. And they try and turn it around and put the liability on you instead of themselves. Well, I was going to say, I'll let you, but, but first of all, I can, I can see by the pink look on your face that you have been there. <laughs> um, or, or at least you, you've been in situations where you thought that was going to happen. Friends. Yeah, um, and, and you're right. There, there can be a situation where you know you told them there were a thousand names that, that, that got taken, and all of a sudden it was a thousand and one, and they're angry at you. And, and again, there is a lot of kill the messenger out there, so you have to be careful about that. But going back to the personal liability, um, first of all, liability insurance for, for guys like us is really cheap. I mean, if any, well, I was going to say, if anybody's going to get sued, and, and, and we always get named in lawsuits when big companies get angry at each other, but, uh, but anyway, $100 a month, 
you can have ridiculously good liability insurance as consultants in, in the tech industry. Not lawyers, though. I, I, I bet it's not $100 a month for, for attorneys. But, um, but that's also something to think about. There, there's really good companies out there. But going back to your question, um, as far as your own liability, remember that your liability is going to be based on what you say. And I hate to get into all legal speak, but you know, when I'm writing affidavits and stuff, you know, I know what the facts are, and you only say the facts. But you also say little words like, um, all right, let's say, let's say, I see a thousand names that got stolen, right? Well, I can say a thousand names got stolen, or I can say the evidence suggests that a thousand names got stolen. Okay, and it's those kind of qualifiers, which uh, which is because I've spent so much time in court. But, um, but, but those kind of things, you know, um, included in the data that was lost was these thousand names, you know, that kind of thing. And that kind of protects you as well. Um, but again, that's why just keeping the attorney in the loop is, is your protection, is your protection. But it doesn't say that they're not going to turn it on you when, it, when things go south. And as I mentioned so, earlier, just make sure that you have your own attorney and that you have your own agreement. You, that's something that should be done up front and you definitely want to have the hold harmless the the, uh, the clause that protects you from liability in the situation but it's important that you have your own legal counsel so that if you do run into an issue you're not the one that's swinging in the wind and you've got your own background and, and again when we talk about liability insurance when we talk about talking to an attorney if you are if you are a freelancer or a small company right and, and yes those things cost money but if you're the guy that's doing that, then you're charging more and you're justifying that. You know, um, if you're working with a client or let's say you're, you're, you're the attorney and then you have somebody like me come to you and I don't have a contract, I don't have insurance, um, there's probably a certain hourly rate that you're expecting to pay. But then when somebody comes in and they're like, okay, here's my contract, here's my engagement, here's how much you're paying me by the hour, and yes, here's a copy of my insurance certificate, and then you throw out a really good hourly rate, you're going to get it because you're showing that you're worth it and you're justified and you got your act together. Because you're also talking about that the, the attorneys and the clients that you work with have to put faith and trust in you that you're going to be a professional, that you're going to do a good job. And so... I guess from a paperwork standpoint, your paperwork is dressing for the job you want. That's one way to look at it, you know, and being able to say, hey, I mean, let me say, if you guys get insurance, if you're if you're a sole practitioner and you got get insurance for yourself, you tell everybody you got insurance. When somebody says, hey, I want you to look at this, you go, well, cool, we're we're insured, you know, we're we're cert if you got a certification, you tell everybody. If you're insured, you tell everybody. If you've got a good contract, that's the first thing you do. give me your contract. Make sure you look professional. What you don't do is tell them you have an attorney. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, I just had a, kind of a general, if you had any, um, I guess, advice, because I work for the InfoSec department for Fortune 500, so I'm kind of on the internal side of it. And a lot of what you've been talking about is kind of if you're an outside contractor looking in. You need to protect yourself on the inside as the same thing we're doing on the outside. The number one thing that you want to make sure of is you're protected. It all comes down to your what, how, how am I doing this? How am I protected? If you're not protected, regardless if you're on the inside or outside, you're the one who's going to be on fire. Okay, uh, it's basically what we do because I work specifically in identity access management. Mm -hmm. So anytime I modify an account, I either have to have an email or a ticket from our ticketing system before I can do anything to it. So you're creating a paper trail at that point. You want that to happen because everything that happens, it needs to be plain as day, black and white. There's no, well, maybe they meant this. No, they need to put it in writing or in words that you can have that says, I want this done. Because if, like, um, here's a simple example. Active Directory. Everybody in here has worked with Active Directory at one point in time in their career, right? So you have a group, a group policy, somebody gets promoted, to another position and they get audited two years later and find out they still have access to information that they shouldn't have. And I believe Derek and I talked about this uh, when we first met. So now I'm allowed to write uh, in checks for the company. 
or previously I was writing checks for the company. Now with my promotion, I authorize those checks for the company. If I still have access to that, I'm a good guy. I'm not going to steal from my company, but my rent is due or my mortgage is due or they're going to take my car. Or my wife is sick and I need money. Somebody's going to write that check and they're going to go by it and they're going to be like, well, it, it only happened this one time. You can't have that happen at all. One, two, it calls into question everything else that's been done. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing we need to mitigate. You need to have those audits done. You need to see where the access is going, much like what you're talking about. So you need to protect yourself on the inside just as much as you do on the outside. Uh, to continue that conversation, I'm, I'm happy to ask that. Um, let's say you are an insider, be it for mom, pa, or large corp incorporated. Um, protecting yourself in an environment that your actions may not be discernible from others, other computer actions, or you may be held accountable for work that was done prior to your presence in this company. How do you protect yourself from those instances that may be held against you later, although may not be discernible from your actual work, and I'm not sure if that's true. You know, I tell you what, that's great, and, and just for y'all's benefit, I'm going to miraculously make two more quick slides appear. <laughs> <laughs> because, um, and, and, and just based on what, what these guys were saying, what is the, the trickiest, scariest, worst um, incident type that you may ever have to deal with and what what is the minefield of incident devices has to deal with what or i'll say what department come on it's a giveaway what department bonus slide you've got a, you got some people in the it department who are your criminals or you think they may be there that can be the worst thing to uh, deal with and why and i'll run through this really quickly because if you're ever called in to investigate um maybe you discover some stuff going on in, in your own department. Um, obviously, the IT guys read everybody's email. We've had so many situations where uh, we've been asked to look at fraud in the IT department, and of course the company's using, the, the, the CEOs have to use his personal email because he thinks he knows the IT guys can read it all. Um, obviously, the ability of disgruntled IT people to control and disable, and you guys can see this, there's multiple options for remote access. You fire an IT guy, and he has ways to get into the company you never even thought of. Um, they have the ability to destroy evidence quickly. If you've got an IT guy who is uh, committing fraud, and I actually give seminars on IT guy fraud. How many people know what the iPad, the iPad thing is, the iPad trick? It's like when you buy, well, when you buy a, um, when you buy a server and it comes with a free iPad, and of course the IT guy gets to keep the iPad, and I keep telling these corporate uh, CFOs and stuff that if your server came with a free iPad, you might not have got the best price on it. Or uh, you're told you need a new piece of equipment and you go out and buy a new server and you find out that your old server's on eBay. Yeah, things like that. Um, but IT guys, IT guys can have access to your domain names and cloud data, so you have to be real careful. We've had a lot of, um, I know you've had to deal with this as well, but we've had a lot of situations where a company has decided they need to fire their IT vendor or their internal IT person or their director. And we've had to sneak into the company in the middle of the night and, um, and, and try to wrestle back the keys to the castle before the person figured it out. In fact, one, one quick story, a, a major municipality, uh, we had a situation where there was fraud in the IT department. And we brought our team in in the middle of the night after we knew the IT guys had gone to bed because we didn't want anybody logging in. Or let me say not gone to bed. They probably switched over to Warcraft. But <laughs> we figured they weren't, you know, actively accessing the system. But what we were accessing was like the local desktops and stuff, taking them offline. And I had specifically given instructions for nobody to go in the server room and they didn't really understand why. And the chief of police and the, uh, the town administrator, they were walking around bored while we are imaging all these systems and they went in the server room. <laughs> and the town administrator got a phone call on her cell phone. Why? Because the head of the IT department had alarms and had a, a motion control webcam in the server room, so he knew when anybody went in the server room, and he got a text message at midnight that somebody went in the server room, and I told him specifically not to do that. But you see, those are special considerations. And then finally, just a couple more reasons why all you guys are set to be the best kind of criminals. Um, the problems when you're dealing with IT guys and fraud, obviously they have all kinds of access to things, and you may have limited access. The bosses may have limited access. Um, 
one of the worst things you may run into is that there's fraud in an IT department and the CFOs and CTOs don't want to admit that they don't understand anything about IT. You may have the guy who's head of the IT department who doesn't know anything about it. That doesn't happen, right? <laughs> yeah, you've never had that problem. Um, and anyway, you see this kind of thing. So, so, and, and I guess finally, as we're as we're closing up to have time for more questions, one of the things that I have discovered, you will discover fraud. You know, IT guys ripping off the company, false invoices, buying stuff the company doesn't need, and selling it, doing all this crazy stuff, and they don't want to get rid of the IT people. Why? Because they know where the bodies are buried. If your company is doing things wrong and committing crimes or whatever. The IT guys know it, <laughs> and, and they never want to fire those guys. So you might, yeah, that might be some job security there. But uh, again, these views don't reflect those of EFS. <laughs> 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 um, but but also too, uh, IT uh, people in the IT department. You know, there may be people who are committing fraud who have a friend in the IT department. And one of the things we talk about too is when you terminate somebody and they've worked at the company for 20 years, they've got friends in the company. They've got people who can go in and delete emails or make mm -hmm. files and stuff go away. So you have to watch those IT guys. So, sorry, a couple more questions? Uh, sorry, out there. Yeah. So, the last two of us, and uh, myself included, yeah. we're all, we work inside the company, and it's really hard to ask for us to go find an attorney outside to protect ourselves because all due respect, ma'am, you're expensive. <laughs> <laughs> but, that, 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 but that's corporate counsel, and, and that's what right. we need. So you, you can rely on your corporate counsel. Right. But the corporate counsel is it's for the yeah. company, not yeah. for us. Well, and, and, and not implying that, that you specifically need an attorney, um, that you need an attorney when you're working internally, but you want to be talking to the attorney for whoever had the intrusion. So if you work um, in-house IT, and you know, all of a sudden you discover that there's been a data loss or intrusion or your boss comes to you and says, oh my gosh, we've got a problem. It's okay for you to say, okay, well, you know, boss, we need to, we need to bring in the company attorney on this in case we discover things. So, so that's the idea. Where it gets tricky is when you're that, um, that, that vendor. When you're the vendor and they call you and say, hey, come fix this, we've had a problem. And you go, okay, well, I need to get your attorney involved. Now they may say, well, wait a minute, that's going to cost me $300 if you, and that's conservative, if you, if you call my attorney. But based on what we've talked about today in these slides and stuff, you can say, hey, look, man, I, I know you're, you're worried about paying my bill and you're worried about you're going to have to spend you know, some money on an IT guy, but trust me, if, you, if what you think happened ends up happening, you're going to want your, your um, attorney to be involved. And, and it may be a deal breaker for you, and that may be tough, but, but it's kind of better to walk away um, you know, from that kind of thing. But now, if you're internal, maybe that's a question you ask when you get back to work on Tuesday. Is just just say, hey, by the way, if we ever did discover that, oh my gosh, you know, we've lost a bunch of patient data, who who is the the company attorney who's responsible for that? Just so we keep them in the loop. And that, and that's really and, and that's one of the biggest things. Sorry, I'll just is that you can tell the attorney bad things. And it makes it, and, and, and have a degree of protection when you're talking to the attorney. You know, you can say, "I think my boss is a crook." Um, I mean, hopefully that's based on some evidence, and you're not just you know, sharing that. But you say, "So yeah, the internal IT people. That's very important." Sorry, I'm going. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of companies have incident response teams, IRTs. If you are in house and your company does not have an incident response team and a business continuity plan and a disaster recovery plan, that's a value that you bring to the table. You can get that going for them and you can make sure that your company has those internal systems and that internal team and that will protect you. That will help protect you because you will know exactly who to go to, what the escalation points are, and, and then you're bringing value to the company. Exactly. Think of, think of this opportunity. You go to work on Tuesday and, and start asking these questions. And, and I would say, if you start asking these questions and you get in trouble, you probably don't want to work for that company because there's a reason why they get uncomfortable when you start asking about that kind of thing. Real quick, show of hands, how many people work for a small mom and pop? Okay. Now, small business. All right. Good number of you. How many people actually have an IoT? Yeah. Okay. I think I saw three. When you go to work on Tuesday, Tread very carefully when asking about this. <laughs> Tread very carefully. I did the exact same thing a little over a year ago uh, at a company I worked for previously. I won't say their name. Uh, walked in, asked that question. 
person who is some shape or form the CTO uh, or at least they think that way of their structure and when I ask that question he's like we'll never get hacked we don't we don't have anything facing out and I just stood there like wow <laughs> and I guess any, I guess one one more are we good I guess we're about ready to all right I guess we need to wrap it up so uh, well you know find us on LinkedIn find us on the internet uh, Ellington.net I love I, obviously people say can you can you come and talk to us and I'm like the problem isn't getting me to talk the problem is getting me to shut up <laughs> um, so any questions guys email me connect with me um, if you're gonna join uh, EFF come grab a button and again uh, it was it was great to, to be with you guys today thank you so much thank you Have a good one. Yes, team.